Almost everything in chemistry needs catalysts to work, but some of them are running out. A laureate who studies surfaces, Gerhard Ertel's work has already proved crucial in the fight to clean up our environment. I really like Ertel's work, this basics on catalysis, which is really fundamental and important. And I really like learning the fundamental science behind how a catalytic converter works. A laureate who runs a lab which invents vitally needed new catalysts is Robert Grubbs. That's the prettiest ruthenium complex I've ever seen. I was going to disagree. I think Grubbs is a better chemist than artist. <laughs> <laughs> is something that helps speed up a reaction. It makes it go faster. And the, the way that it works is what we study as scientists. Like, how does it make it go faster? Well, it helps those molecules orient or brings them together or um, makes them want to react with each other. Catalysts are absolutely crucial. But supplies of those based on rare metals, such as rubidium, palladium, and platinum, are not unlimited. There is a potential shortage. Do you think there's a problem? Do you think we can solve it? <laughs> the problem is caused mainly by the fact that they mainly come from China. Yes, And, and yes. They're, they're from monopoly on it, yeah, yeah. So, right. so if the market would be uh, more open, this is, I think there would be no shortage anymore. It's a more uh, political issue, uh, not a scientific issue. But what happens when uh, non-developed countries or developing countries start to become, I guess, just more developed and say you have a lot more drivers and a lot more cars and now we have a lot more catalytic converters? Yeah. What's that going to do to our supply of, say, platinum and palladium and rhodium for things like catalysis and synthetic chemistry? Should synthetic chemists be worried about using up platinum, palladium, rhodium for other applications? There are strong efforts to replace the noble metals by, yeah. by oxides of less noble metals. So far, not with very much success. So, so, yeah, so still, still a lot of research has to be done there. Yeah, yeah. And you know, in the synthetic area, people are trying to move from platinum and palladium to nickel. And right. in our area, where we're in the ruthenium thing, we're trying to switch to iron. But you know, so you know, I, I think those are the directions people are trying to go in. But again, chemistry controls what you can do. Right. So I'd like to just set up a sort of very hypothetical, contrived situation. Let's say we have absolutely no more palladium, platinum, rhodium, yeah. ruthenium, these types of metals. Yeah. What are we going to be affected by? What happens to the earth? What happens to our standard of living around the world? Perhaps we'll have cars which are not running with gasoline. That's right. Yep. And with, but with hydrogen or fuel cells. Fuel cells, yeah. And then you have no exhaust. And perhaps yeah. you don't need the catalyst anymore. Yeah. So, but fuel cells are also running on platinum usually. <laughs> so. Yeah, perhaps we'll find other metals, metals for that. Yeah. As, as a materials for the electrodes. That's right. So that, that sounds like a actually a really fantastic world in in, in, the, <laughs> in thinking about emissions and global warming and problems with uh, carbon-based fuels. So should we really be pushing people to not use these kinds of metals because the world that you just described sounds pretty advanced and far as so far. So we're not ready for it. Apparently. Uh, Robert Grubbs and Gerhard Ertel don't seem to have they a problem with it. They just don't think it. it's a problem. Yeah, yeah. I really thought at the outset that they were going to say, you know, really push hard, really try to drive your science toward right. abundant metals, so things like iron, things that we could just dig up out of the ground right. anywhere. But uh, they, they didn't say that at all, and no. so <laughs> maybe, it does, it, maybe it sways my opinion a little bit about what we need to do as chemists in order to make really efficient catalysts. Yeah. And, I still see that it might get a problem about politics and about yeah how, how to get there. I mean, not about the amounts, but I, I have the feeling that it could just get a political problem. Right. I mean, for oil now, there are political issues. There are yeah almost wars sometimes. So could it be that you also said that, for example, platinum or rarest metals are mainly mined in China or in, in, in African countries South or something. But maybe there yeah. might also be some political interferences then. We might not run out of platinum or palladium or rare metals, yeah. but China could really restrict, I, I mean, the US especially, because we 
import 100% of our yeah. rare metals. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, platinum and palladium comes mostly from South Africa. It's the other, oh, yes, the other rare sorts of things that come from China. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I can understand that young people are concerned about these problems, but there are other problems which are much more serious at the moment. The energy crisis and uh, environmental issues. They are more and more demanding and looking for solutions than the supply of, of precious materials. So heterogeneous catalysis is a basis of chemical industry. And one of the most important catalyst reactions was the Haber-Bosch process, the formation of ammonia from elements nitrogen and hydrogen. And this figure shows the variation of the world population and the variation of the production of ammonia over time. And you see there's a close parallelity. There's an estimate that one third of the world population would starve without this reaction. I loved your presentation the other day because I'm studying nitrogenase for the same reason of wanting to make catalysts uh, that are more efficient because nitrogenase is able to catalyze nitrogen from into ammonia at room temperature and ambient pressure, um, whereas the Haber-Bosch process is very high pressures and very high temperatures. And it's really interesting that scientists have been studying this problem for a really long time. You said yourself that it took 70 years to understand the mechanism That's right, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was going on on solid surfaces. Yeah, right. Why did it take so long to figure out the mechanism, even though we use it so readily? Catalysis is complicated. Especially surface catalysis, yeah, yeah. where you're dealing with very small amounts of material, surface yeah. states, and you, you really help develop the tools which <laughs> yeah. allow us to uh, <laughs> allow us to start to look and understand. Before it was just total Edisonian. Oh, I, I used to consult for people in industry who would do heterogeneous catalysis, and oh. you know, you talk, and they would say, "I did a little barium, and it got better, so I added some more. It got better. <laughs> what should I do next?" And you know, you add more barium. Who knows why? But it works. So it yeah. used to be a black art. That's yeah, yeah, totally black like art. Yeah, right. In some ways, it seems like it still is. There are a lot of people in subfields of chemistry who are still just kind of yeah. mixing and seeing what happens. It's almost impossible from fundamental research mm -hmm. to predict. How you can increase the, the uh, volatility by one percent? Yeah, right, yes, right. So this, this is trial and error. Right. Sometimes you can have surprises. Gold, yes. Yes. gold was considered to be completely inactive. Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, until some researcher from Japan found that very small overlayers of gold become active. Yeah. yeah. So two two monolayers of gold are catalytically active, and this is still a very uh, hot topic in research. Mm -hmm. Why just this small amount of gold is active? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. I think there will be uh, enough surprises as well with other materials. We just have to work on it. Hey, you take information from where you can get it. It used to be a black art for more than 100 years because almost nothing was known about the mechanisms underlying the chemical process taking place on, on the catalyst. We know much more, but uh, we still don't know everything uh, about the different parameters which are influencing the catalytic activity. We're talking about combustion. Mm -hmm. We have been burning things for a very, oh, yeah. very long time, right. oh, yeah. and we still do not understand everything about well, it. Of course not. Yeah, but all these processes are very complicated. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Com combustion, these are yeah. many different uh, reactions, and yes. chain reactions, and, and, and which take place with radicals and so on. It's not just the transformation of one molecule in another one. Yeah. I didn't realize that it was so complex. So I'm still a pretty new PhD, which is why I'm so enthusiastic. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. so well, well, you can say enthusiastic. I've been in a long time. I'm hoping it's he's, okay. he's, he's still very enthusiastic. Yeah. He's been doing it a while. <laughs> but to come back to the idea of nature catalyzing things at ambient temperatures and pressure, and they've had millions of years, is that the end of the continuum? We reach a point in which we have very complex systems, which we can use very abundant metals? Maybe. In some cases, we will. Other cases, we'll still have to use platinum and palladium. You think so? <laughs> yeah. If you just think of ammonia synthesis, the catalyst works for t up to 20 years. Right, that's right. The natural catalysts don't do, do, do it. They are replaced. They are continuously yeah, replaced. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have to be better than nature then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> catalyst research is considered to be the basis for the solution of our environmental and energy problems related also with the global warming. It's quite obvious that in the future, hydrogen will be the source of our energy demands here, yeah? because we have enough sunlight. Only less than 1% of the sunlight uh, is needed. And uh, the conversion of energy uh, from the sun 
into other materials which can be stored, catalysis will be the key for the solution of these problems. The best thing that the U.S. could do for carbon footprint would be to teach China how to frack. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they could convert their coal power plants into natural gas. Oh, I that's don't a think that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not an idea. Well, but, but, but what else are you going to do? They're going to burn coal. Yeah, but, but there are changes. I mean, the people are changing now, and they are looking for sustainable of energy. Course. Yeah. And I think it's, it's not a good idea. I mean, if the people are saying, let's do fracking, but, uh, well, let's do it in some country where we don't care. No, it's uh, not that. That's, no. Uh, that's, I mean, that's not, not making sense. And even, especially China, I mean, they have platinum. They have rare earth metals. But, so but they've got lots them. and lots of coal, and they need energy, so they burn coal. Yeah, but, but we could, I mean, what? if we want to teach them something, then I would say it's a good way to teach them how to do catalysis, how to use their rare earth metals, which they have. But, but that doesn't help them uh, get around, well, eat their houses, run their air conditioners, live the lifestyle they want to live. Yeah, but it can. It can? I mean, a catalysis, no. like, like uh, you, you can teach them, okay, use sustainable energy, then use this energy to produce, for example, hydrogen, use the hydrogen to... To, to use electricity in your I, 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 I think we get there eventually, but I don't see us doing that short term. Short, you know, we've got to get through the next next 15 years until we get all this stuff built up. Yeah, but I think it's pushing, uh, pushing it as soon as possible is the best way, because just saying, okay, as long as we have coal and as long as we have oil, just let's using it. But I think it's so much more valuable to use it for chemicals. And if we once run out, we cannot you use it for other things anymore. I completely agree with you. I completely agree, but... Yeah, but that's the task of the scientists to, to, to really to mourn. But it's also the question whether you are a pessimist or an optimist. That's right. Uh, yeah, really. I prefer to be optimistic. If you look back in history, whenever there was a serious problem, yeah. men could like overcome Hitler. it. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. So I'm, I'm convinced that we'll, we'll also overcome it. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, I would love if China quit digging coal. But, but they're not going to. Then, I, then, I mean. Instead, wait, wait. they are then digging maybe platinum <laughs> or other palladium. No, no, they're digging platinum and palladium too. Wait, but, you know, but China actually now has one of the largest solar uh, programs going. They're developing an incredible rate. They're developing wind at an incredible rate. Well, but it's just not keeping up. Which all requires rare metals, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> uh, they do. Yes, yeah, so I do, yeah. In my opinion, the world is really going for renewable energies and what we can do this and that this will be not something in hundreds of years, but that will be something in my lifespan. And he was just saying, come on, relax, this is not realistic, and I don't believe that it's going. And he said, okay, let's do fracking and all this stuff, and I, I, I can't just accept this. And I, I, I'm really forcing and saying, okay, we can do this, we just have to want it. Bob Grubbs was like, sort of, I agree with you, but right now no one wants to pay right. the cost for it. So it comes back to the economy, but I, I really like that you were really pressing him. Yeah. <laughs> he was kind of being a devil's advocate because he was like, I would love for that to happen. It's not going to happen. And then, so you were like, no, it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. There is this area in organic chemistry called organocatalysis, which is using organic molecules as catalysts for things. And so uh, that's been going for years, but now it's really become a focused focused area and with a title and... Uh, but it's more limited, right? Because you, it has to be so much more complicated and more organized and more thought out. And well, I don't know. I mean, we, we you know, our stuff's pretty it, organized it, it, and all thought out, but... The low amounts of, of uh, yeah. metals always in, or...? No, 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 not always. No, no. So some of them are very clean. Uh, you know, they tend to be lower turnovers and much more catalyst loading uh. and stuff. But, but they're pretty simple. They have no metals to get rid of at the end. Is it conceivable that we'd ever use such a catalyst for uh, producing chemicals on an industrial scale? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there, I mean, there's, there's, there's organic catalysts now. So you, you know, don't think we geolites. should shift our attention away from rare metals? We can keep working with rare metals and platinum, palladium. I think so. We got to solve problems. How do we solve them? Yeah, <laughs> however we can. I mean, use what we have. Use what we've got. Let's plan for the future, but we've got to get through right now. And maybe it is our turn. Maybe it just goes over to us to say we are still. We, we have the power. We have the feeling, and we have the enthusiasm. I, I sort of agree, right? So they've laid scientific foundations. Yeah. They're sort of giants in our field, and so. At some point, they really have to pass the torch on the, the younger scientists. And they seem to be very good at laying out the problems for us and being like, you have many tools at your disposal, yes. and these are the problems. And so we just need really passionate you know, people to go out and try yeah. to solve these problems.